Lift your Bibles with me now and say with me now, Father God in heaven, let your word be in my mind. Let your word be in my heart. Let your word be on my lips. And most importantly, let your grace show in my life. Amen and amen. I'm going to turn to the psalm first of all. Psalm 40. One of the things that I believe God is showing today and that is his intention and we saw in in the law God's intention was right there in the law and his intention is that the law should be interpreted through love but unfortunately as human beings we're obviously trying to make things work and trying to get things right and we're all about right and wrong and am I doing right and am I not doing right and we look at other people and try to justify ourselves when we look at other people to try and see if we're doing right by comparison and so there's an intention that goes through and Christ was right there at the beginning we know and the whole of the scriptures is to show God's intention God's intention was not to be cruel to people God's intention was to love people God's intention was to give people standards to live by and sin is just about missing the mark that's why God doesn't grade sin sin is sin if you've broken the least of the commandments it's as if you've broken them all but as human beings we tend to grade things and of course in the law we tend to grade things even in the law of the land but even the law itself having studied law I know that the, at the heart of the law is intention it's supposed to be just it's not always fair but it's just that's one of the things you learn when you study law it's not always fair but it is just but the most important thing when you're deciding and determining things like murder and things like that it's all about intention what was the intention so when you're thinking about this and you're going through the scriptures and you're trying to work out God's will in your life and especially in relationship because that's where we have most of our issues come around relationships with other people we are not to judge people we're supposed to love people but what's the intention so if you're concerned about something you have a dispute with someone for example you don't agree with someone or somebody is persecuting you somebody is attacking you in some way somebody is trying to do you harm in some way they may have what they appear to have as everyone's best interest at heart and they may just want to attack you to show that they're on the side of right now all the churches and all the people in the churches all the Christians and all the various faiths they all believe they're right yes or no and so we all think we're right <coughs> so how do we know when we're right so this is where we go to the law of intention when they said that Jesus well he was just he used to be with drunkards and sinners so he wasn't any better than them law of intention when we look at God's heart and we see the law and we think that can be quite cruel at times what was the intention the law of intention was right there God gave us the law as a shadow of what was to come through Jesus Christ through the love of God and so when you want to determine what's going on in your life with other people you can make a list of things that you're doing and things that they're doing and then look at the intention look at the intention was even if you may have done something wrong what was your intention at the end of the day the law is built on intention and the other thing is the scriptures are all about intention God doesn't look at the outward you may seem to be doing something wonderfully good on the outside 
But what's your intention? Yeah? People have actually criticized us because they say, oh, you're just, off, you're just out for money. You teach in your church about money. Well, <laughs> excuse me, but the, the Bible teaches about money and about tithing and about the right way to treat our money and consider our money to be God's money. And he gives us money and we earn our money and that's fine. And we should give back to God a portion of what he's given to us. What's the intention of your heart? Whose money is it to start with? Who owns all the resources of the earth to start with? God does. And people say, well, you know, you've done this wrong or you've done that wrong. But what was the intention? When they say to you, you've, you've been bad, you've done this wrong, you've, done, you've made mistakes, you've done things wrong, what's your intention? And when you look at people's intentions, that's when you begin to see what's in the heart. And that's what God looks at. Was your intention to help people or hurt people? In your relationships with other people, is your intention to hurt them, to be malicious, to be nasty, or to be gracious and good? It doesn't mean you can't defend yourself. It doesn't mean to say that you have to stand up to be abused. Obviously, if you're persecuted, then we rejoice because God's the one who will deal with that, not us. Great is our reward in heaven. We're going to face persecution. We're going to face trials. But when you're living your daily life and you're trying to work out what is the right way forward in situations, if your heart is right, and they say, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, well, yes, okay, there is an element of that in everything, you know. But at the same time, are you, are you really out f for money? Do you value things above people or do you both value people above things? Do you try to help people? You know, how much do you help people by comparison to how much you're trying to suck out of people? Are you a giver or a taker? You know, we all have to live. We all have to pay our bills. I mean, at the moment, we've got all these strikes going on and you think, why are these people trying to hold the country to ransom? They know that we've just come through COVID. They know that everybody's struggling right now. With the war in Ukraine, all the prices have, have gone up of food, oil, everything is, is going for everybody. So now is a good idea. Let's just all strike and cause even more problems and want more money. The world's gone mad. It's gone absolutely crazy. Of course we all need more money. But when people strike and cause devastation in the country it's very selfish it's very selfish and at the same time we know that people should get what they deserve a, a worker is worth their wages the bible tells us that and that's fine but we're all in the same boat at the moment we're all suffering the same problems at the moment and so therefore all this can actually be seen in a, in a different way once we start to realize we have got to pull together what is our intention is it all me 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 you know pull up the ladder mate I'm all right <laughs> it's just wrong so when you see intentions of people try to work out what their intentions are are their intentions good or are, or are they their intentions coming from a very selfish place. When people attack you, even if they say it's because of a great cause, well, are th is there another way other than attacking you? W what else could they do? How else could they work with it? What could they do instead? And how do you react? What's your reactions? What are you trying to do? When you have to determine the outcome of a disagreement. What do you do about it? What were your intentions in the first place? Were your intentions to hurt someone? Or were your intentions to do the right thing? Or just to, to help people generally? That's where you've got to look. 
And just because someone says, I have good intentions and I'm doing something because of this cause or that cause, that's where the road of hell to hell is paved with good intentions. If you're prepared to hurt other people just because you have a cause, like a knight in shining armour, you know, Sir Galahad charging forward, having to be the saviour. Maybe you have a saviour complex. Maybe that's what's happening. Start thinking about that. Where is it coming from? You're prepared to hurt other people for that. And it can be that people help you in many ways. But you could be very ungrateful. And because you have a cause, it's okay to attack everybody and hurt people. So look at the intentions behind things. Do we help people in the church? Or are we just here to take? What do we do? What is ministry about? Are we here just to teach you a prosperity gospel and take all your money and say, well, if you put a thousand pounds in our ministry, you're going to be blessed? We don't say that. We don't push that. But we do tell you the, that the Bible says we should be tithing, we should be supporting ministry. There's nothing wrong with that. when we help people in the college, when we give scholarships and discounts. It's obvious that we're not out for money when we're giving people such heavy discounts of over 50% sometimes. It's a not-for-profit college. <laughs> we don't make profit on the college. In fact, we volunteer even to do the teaching. We get paid for what we do in our daily work. But people have a problem with that sometimes. What's our intention? We give great discounts on people to get therapy sometimes when we know they're struggling. We often, it was set up originally, the college was set up as a not-for-profit to help people on benefits and single parent families and we've helped people with that all the way through. But the minute you do something that someone doesn't like or they think that you're wrong, they can turn on you like a pack of wolves. So you have to be aware of this. Our whole intention is to help people. That's what we're doing. So our consciences are clear, and we continue to do that. And if you have people attacking you, what is your conscience saying? Are you going to just defend yourself? Or are you going to be malicious and nasty and vindictive and try and attack people and forget any good you've had, any good you've been given? What's the intention of the person you're having problems with? What's your intentions? Look at that. Write it down, make a list of each side and look for the intentions. In the same way we look for the intentions in here in the scriptures and we see God's heart, you need to see the heart of the people of what they're doing and what they're trying to do. Are we here to extort people? Are we here to target people, to groom people? Are we here to hurt people? No, not a chance. My heart wouldn't let me do that. And the thing is people really do know in their conscience and they're torn and they want what they want and they have their causes and they have what they but at the same time they're torn because your intention wasn't to hurt them your intention was to help and you see that you see that even when people attack you you see that they're torn on the one minute they're saying I love you and I'd never hurt you and the next minute they're they're attacking you but they're torn in their psyche it's really quite interesting to see when you have any kind of attacks. Look at what's behind it. Look at where it's coming from. It's usually status or, or finance or something, or jealousy, there's something in, at the back of it. What's their intention and what's your intention? And if your intention is right, and you're trying to do things in the right way, but maybe you make mistakes along the way, but you're still trying to help people. You know, I had a person who was homeless and I, I, I got them to come and stay with me and three months later, the person left my house when I wasn't there and took my laptop and camera with them. <laughs> this is what happens. To be, to be someone who's giver, if you're, if you're going to be giving and loving, you, you're vulnerable. You're going to be attacked. You're going to have people take advantage. And it happens all the time. You know, I've had people that have given me glowing feedback and wonderful testimonies. 
but they've listened to other people along the way and suddenly you're the worst thing since since Hitler and yet they've said to you you've saved my life what's going on what's going on in this world it's crazy right but this is look at the intention look at the intentions there is evil out there there are people who are being influenced by evil I don't believe they're <coughs> evil per se and we pray for these people they don't realize it but we do actually pray for people like this and this is what I urge you to do bless and do not curse defend yourself of course you need to you need to defend your income you need to defend your business you need to defend your reputation by saying what is true by coming against evil but our fight is against the heavenly realms that's where our fight is because the spiritual determines the physical and if people are being influenced by evil we have to we have to stand up for justice we have to come against justice injustice and just because someone says they have a cause and they have what they think is a just cause that's their subjective truth it doesn't mean to say it's the complete truth the truth is always somewhere in the middle if two people are disagreed the truth is somewhere in the middle but it's not always with someone and almost certainly not with anyone who's malicious or nasty so work it out for yourself don't be a fool in this life be wise as serpents and gentle as doves your wisdom will come from the scriptures what is the intentions of the heart because that's how God judges us that's how Jesus sees us that's how the father looks upon us he sees the heart like he saw the heart of David did David make mistakes you bet your life he did and in our situation whopping great big ones in God's situation sin is sin there is no grading of sin if you've missed the mark in one place you've missed it in every place as far as God's concerned he's no respecter of persons his standards are just and right so our standards need to start to match up to his so just look at this when you start to read these scriptures just look at these different aspects of God's love and sending his son Jesus and even John the Baptist talking about the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world we all need Jesus regardless of your intentions regardless of how you are what cause you're fighting or whatever we all need Jesus none of us are perfect we are only righteous in our own eyes this is where we get it wrong when you go back to the scriptures and ask God and come before God and say God look at my heart what is my intention in what I'm doing how do I know I'm doing the will of God well I'm fighting this great cause really really you're fighting this great cause really are you doing the will of God though never mind your great cause in the world but are you doing the will of God are you your intentions are good towards people are you trying to help people what are you doing who's at the back of you who's influencing you look at the politicians they're great at all the nominalizations they make and they're always telling you they're doing something good you know we've had Boris we've had Theresa May we've had now we've got Rishi you know we, we've all sorts of people and they'll always tell you straight well, I'm doing the right thing I'm doing good I'm everything you know but but you know when they come into the light things are revealed we cannot trust the politicians that's the problem you can only trust God and pray for the politicians that's all you can do for the leaders that's why we're told to pray for our leaders it's really important so just because someone says that they're doing the right thing look at their intentions of their heart get behind it's like when we read the scriptures we need to look at the intentions of God's heart so we don't look at the letter of the law we look at the spirit behind it Jesus saw the law of God but looked for the spirit behind it he didn't see it as rules and regulations that would hurt people he saw it as a law of love 
so he interpreted the Ten Commandments in just two. And we have to do the same. This Psalm 40, it says, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me. In other words, he turned towards me. He inclined to me and he heard my cry. God hears our cries. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit. Well, when I was saved, I don't know about you, but I came out from a ba pretty bad place. <coughs> and I really felt God's love in my heart. And that really changed me. Does it mean I'm perfect? Does it mean I do things wrong? Of course. I still have the old man inside me. I still struggle every day like everybody else. We are at a crossroads every day. Do I follow God or do I follow my own desires, my own interests, my own wants? And yes, of course. So we don't, we don't become perfect. We don't get it right overnight. It, grace takes time. And we have to work things out with God over time. And sometimes people don't understand your intentions. Quite on, often, in the same way that most people out there don't understand God's intentions. They will say God is cruel. Look at what he's done in the Old Testament. Look at all the people that died. Well, you have to look further than that to his intentions. So he, it says, he also brought me up out of a horrible pit out of the miry clay. Have you ever been in miry clay? Have you ever tried to walk through clay? <laughs> Have you ever tried to dig clay? Have you ever had a garden and done some digging? And you get to clay. It's waterlogged. It's sticky. It's like it sticks to everything. And if you were to try and walk through clay, it's like walking through a swamp with quicksand almost and it sucks you in and it gets hold of your your boots and it doesn't let them go and this is what it's like the miry clay what is that that is the worldliness that is the obsession of the world around the flesh and then there's also the devil who is snatching at your heels your achilles heel all the time he's trying to stop you from walking with the Spirit. He's trying to stop you from being in the Spirit. He's trying to slow you down in your service. He's trying to stop you. He's trying to really grab hold of you. And that's what sin's effect does on our life. It, it grabs us and, and it can imprison us and enslave us. And it's really sometimes quite difficult to get out of you know once you get into a sinful state it's more difficult to get out of it it's far better to run away the minute you see anything that is wrong to run away than actually get into that sinful area put distance between yourself and that situation and it says and set my feet upon a rock and establish my steps so this is where God comes in and when we're falling into sin or we're getting entrapped with sin or Satan or the world, if we come to God and we trust God and we say, God, listen, I'm finding myself in this situation. I don't know how I got here, but psh, I'm in a bad place. I don't feel as though I'm in a good place here. I feel as though I've been seduced into doing this. And yet, I need to get out of it. And I need your strength to get out of it. Al Alcoholics Anonymous work on a 12-step program. They've ditched the idea of God now, they just work with a higher being, but at the same time, they realize that they ca in their own resources they cannot resolve their addictions in the, uh, in the AA, in these 12-step programs. It's all about finding your higher being to give you the strength to help you get out of the miry clay. That's what it's about says in verse 3, He's put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. Now, this is about our testimony. So when he takes you out of sin, when he pulls you out of that awful thing that you're being sucked into, and you decide to do what is right, the right thing, and you start to change something, a lot of people don't like that, and they will fight against you. Uh, well, we did it this way before, and it was all right. Now you're changing things, and I don't like it. 
Well, when we realize we've made mistakes, we have to try and rectify them. Yes or no? That's what we have to do. And so when we do that, we know that our strength has come from God. We know that God's standards has actually helped us. The Holy Spirit has convicted us of any faults or problems or mistakes we've made and we try to do it right. And it means we change. People shouldn't have a problem with that, but they do. But it means that we can have a testimony and say, praise God that I was pulled out of that and now I'm trying to do things right. So let's just go forward and do things right and trust in the Lord. And it says many will see it and fear. Many will, When you're doing right, people do suddenly realize, oh, okay, yeah, we, we need to do it right too. Yeah, let's, let's do it right together. And that's great. But there are some who are influenced by Satan who will not want to do that. And if it's in their interest and their gain, they will not go there. What's the intention? Whose intention is right there? Doing right and getting it right and changing? Or not changing and leaving it because someone else doesn't like the fact you've changed things? Because it doesn't suit them. They can't gain out of it what they expected to gain. They wanted to do it their way. But you've changed it to do the right. And that's your intention. Verse 4 says, Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. So we get blessed when we trust God. And does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. So this is where we have to be very aware. Especially when people are attacking you and making straw men. Do you understand that phrase? Do you understand the idea of someone attacking you by creating a straw man? Well, this would be an attack of a straw man. This happens with people who rationalize. What they do is they get a few truths about you. Things that everyone knows. George is a minister. George runs a college. George is the therapist. So there are things that you can use straight away that are truths that other people go, oh yeah, I, yeah, get that. And then they'll build a straw man on that. So they'll embellish things around. George is a minister and when he ministers he teaches on tithing but then they'll put a twist in it. George is targeting for distortion, for extortion. He's trying to extort money. This is a minister, so it's almost halfway believable. So now we've built a bit of a straw man. So then we can add something else to it. Let's pick up another truth, which is an obvious thing that everybody knows. Find something else that you know that's true. Something about you, for example. I could say, I understand certain things about you. And if I say that to someone about how you are, generally, guess what's going to happen? I've already, got, I've already got them believing me to start with. So now I can build that straw man. I can bring in fabricated lies. I can get things and twist them. And other people go, <gasps> really? And then when they get something else, they can twist something else. Another little fact. Did you realize that George was actually doing something with this person? Well, guess what? <coughs> twist, lies, building this straw man. And obviously it's all built on fabrication and lies, but there are elements of truth in it, so it's partway believable. And if you throw enough mud against a wall, some of it sticks, and that's what happens. And it will happen with you. I'm sure it may have happened with you in the past, and you haven't even realized that someone has done that to you. And it's influenced by evil. The intention is not good. I lived with someone who did this to me. I, I recognize it now very, very quickly when someone does this. I had a marriage built on this. When someone was just deciding that they were going to put me down, criticize, condemn and complain. I could say I married my father. <laughs> He was mentally ill and he put me down from birth. He hated me from birth. 
And so in our resolution compulsion, sometimes we marry our mother or our father who's caused us pain and problems. And this is the same sort of thing that he would use. The psychiatrist said he, he had rationalization. He had massive OCD. Uh, unfortunately, this is still my father. Unfortunately, you know, you can still bless and not curse. I don't put it down to him, I put it down to his disease, to his sickness. He was still my father. He still kept a roof over my head. He still provided me with food. He still provided me with clothing. So I bless him for that. And he was one of my master teachers. I learned a lot from my father. And then you go and marry your father because you're still trying to resolve all those problems, trying to get your father to love you when he hated you. So... You know what criticism is. You understand what being put down is. You know what, you know, this term gaslighting is the new one for narcissists, isn't it? This is the new phrase that's out there. Oh, you gaslit me. Really? <laughs> How much of it is your own stuff projecting? How much is your own stuff coming out of your own wounding? But the fact of the matter is, God can bring us out of that miry clay. God can set our feet on a rock. When we put trust in God and our intentions and our heart is good, God will vindicate you. That's what you have to remember. You don't need to fear. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I declare in the name of Jesus Christ. And that's what we have to do. You have to stand up and be counted and say, hang on, let's look at this whole argument and see where the intentions are. Where are the intentions here? What's happening? What is God doing for He loves his people. He wants to make them right. He wants to set their feet on a rock. That's the whole point. And this is also about Jesus Christ. This is also prophetic about Jesus. Not turning aside to lies. If you want to attack someone, attack them with the truth. Don't attack them with lies. Don't invent things. Don't make things up. <laughs> Amazing what happens. We had someone who came to stay and almost for almost a year because <laughs> they were homeless. And they were a good, a very good help because they gave my mother companionship. And someone has twisted that around to say that we enslaved them, that they were unpaid carers. This is wrong. It's lies. It's not true. But it's twisted because the truth is the person was there. Truth is we did let that person stay and they did stay rent free utilities free they didn't pay anything for a year but they were there not as a carer they were there as a companion for my mother because she had night terrors along with other people who helped but someone else has got hold of that and twisted it with lies this is what happens you've got to be prepared for these things so your intentions may be good, but someone wants to twist it and make it something else. You do the math. Where was the intention on both sides? The person bought a house, didn't see him for dust. This is what happens in the world. You have to think about this. Intention. It's all about intention. Five. Many, O Lord my God, are your wonderful works, which you have done, and your thoughts towards us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than they can be numbered. God does amazing things for us. And sometimes God does amazing things through our friends and helps us in, in many ways. And we're grateful for the support and help we've had with my mother, who's got Alzheimer's and now in a care home and so now she does have carers and we are actually paying for that and that's fair enough 
but we really appreciated the help of the people that helped us from the church and from our friends. And that really, you know, touched my heart to know that people wanted to do that. And when people have got good intentions, they appreciate your help and you appreciate their help. But there are some people who are influenced by evil who will try and twist everything. They really do. It's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. So look at intentions. Verse 6, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. So here's God, his intention. He, he, he doesn't want sacrifice and offerings. He wants our heart. What's our intention? Outwardly, we want to give sacrifices and offerings outwardly to make ourselves look good, right? My ears you have opened, it says here. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. This is about Jesus. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is written, is within my heart. So the law of God is within our heart. We know the Ten Commandments, but we also know Jesus' view of the Ten Commandments, and if we obey those, and we want to do good to people, and we treat our neighbour as ourselves, and we really do it because we love God, God knows our hearts and our intentions. That's the important thing we have to remember today. Verse 9 says, I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips. O oh Lord, you yourselves know. I have, hidden, I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not conceived your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. Do not withhold your tender mercies from me, O Lord. Your, let your loving kindness and your truth continually preserve me, for innumerable evils have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me, so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of my head, therefore my heart fails. So this is a, a psalm that is prophe prophesying Christ and what happened to him. And at the same time, the psalmist is realizing their own transgressions, their own iniquities. And so, when we have our own iniquities, our heart fails us. You know, we have a test that we can do to see if someone's lying. And basically, what happens when someone's lying is that they lose their strength. So we have a test with the body that we can do with people, if someone is lying or not. And we immediately know if someone's lying. And you can't hide it. That's the point. You can't hide it. When you actually have this test, if you're prepared to do this test, better than any polygraph, because your, your strength fails when you lie. You're in contradiction with yourself. And psychologically, you know that it's our brain that moves our body, right? And when you don't actually have the truth in you, what happens is your strength fails. Why is it that David persevered against Goliath? Because he was standing for the truth. Why is it that other people have prevailed in fights and battles when they really believed the truth? You know, if your heart is right and you really, your strength is there. It's amazing. Look at Isaiah. Listen, O coastlands, to me and take heed, you peoples from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb. From the matrix of my mother he has made mention of my name and he's made my mouth like a sharp sword. Wow. In the shadow of his hand he has hidden me and made me a polished shaft and his quiver has hidden me. Wow. This is what happens when we are in God. When we are following a call of God in our life, he makes our words. My mouth becomes like a sharp sword. The word of God cuts through joints and marrow. 
flesh and bone, soul and spirit. He's made my mouth like a sharp sword. And that sharp sword is not an attacking sword, you understand. It's a sword that cuts through to the truth. That we speak the truth in love. That we bring the truth. That we fight against injustice. Even injustice against ourselves. We need to stand up and be truthful and be honest. And say, this is what's happening. This is what the real truth. You may have heard other rumors. You may have heard other things. But this is the truth. You need to hear both sides of the story. You need to listen to the truth. And obviously, the subjective truth is in each one of us, but the real truth is somewhere in between which God knows and God understands, and that detects and determines our intentions. That's how we determine the truth. What did Solomon do? The wisest man on earth. A woman stood in front of him, two women stood in front of him, with a baby. Both of them said it was theirs. What did he do? Okay, give me the baby. I know what to do. I'm just going to cut it in half. Gets his sword out. Cut it in half and give her half each. Because you can have half each. It's okay. And what did the, what did the real mother do? No, 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 give it to her. Right? What did the other one? Oh, yeah, that's all right. I'll have, I'll have half. That's where the intention comes of the heart. Don't be fooled by people saying, this is mine, that's mine, this is right, this is wrong, I'm on a cause, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm going to say this and I'm going to do the right thing and I'm going to make things... Really? <laughs> really? Look for the intention. Where is it going, really? Where is it really coming from? Think about it. It's important. But we need wisdom and we need to be wise as serpents, gentle as doves. And he's made my mouth like a sharp sword. I can bring the truth. I can bring understanding to situations. Verse 3 says, And he said to me, You are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just reward is with the Lord and my work with my God. So this is where my truth is, this is where my work is, this is where my righteousness comes from, is in my work for God, because I'm not doing it in my own strength, I'm doing it in the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 5 says, And now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel is gathered to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. This is where we stand. God has to be our strength, as it was with Jesus Christ. God is our strength. Verse 6 says, Indeed, it's, he says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles. This is Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. That he's going to be a light to the Gentiles as well, not just his people Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. This is us prophesied in Isaiah. All those years, hundreds of years before Christ came. Verse 7 says, Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel. It's God who's the Redeemer, not us. I can't redeem myself. Only God will redeem me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper because God will redeem me. All things work together for the good of those who really love God from the heart. Not outwardly, not speaking it, but actually meaning it because they have a changed heart, because God's touched their heart and changed them. And they're no longer being influenced by Satan. They're actually being influenced by God. And their intentions and their heart is right. And God says, I look upon the heart. This is what happens here. And he becomes our redeemer then. Their holy one. That's my holy one. To him who man despises, to him whom the nation abhors. This is Jesus they're talking about. To the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, and he has chosen you. Jesus was the chosen one. He was the begotten one. We say it in our liturgy. He was begotten, not made. In other words, he wasn't man-made. He was God-made. He was created in the womb of Mary. By God, not by man. Of course he was in the flesh because he was made in the womb of a human being. But God 
begot him. He wasn't made by man. He wasn't made by normal reproduction. This is what it's talking about. He chose you, Jesus, for that purpose. But it also speaks to us. He's chosen us to carry on the work of Jesus on this earth. Amen? Amen. Amen.